Now, I want to jump into this because I'm excited about the word God's given me today. Last week, we started a series called Get Wisdom. How many of you were here last week so I could know? Okay, so about half of you. Okay, Get Wisdom is a new series we started. If you were not here last week, those of you that are online, if you have not Listen to last week's sermon. I encourage you to go back and listen to it because I'm building on it today. And so if you just hear today, there'll be some incomplete parts where you'll be wondering, how does this fit? So this is one message in two parts. Get wisdom. But before we get started, I want to show you this video uh, that I had for you last week, and I think this will explain it. Now, before we turn on the video, let me just prep it for a second. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but there's a lot of technology breakthroughs. And one of the biggest breakthroughs in technology now is they have the ability to, quote-unquote, see through quantum physics the spirit realm. This is science here. They can see the spirit realm. And uh, this is actually a video that I found on YouTube of, of, they call it the God's Eye Camera. And it really is seeing people's life through the realm of the spirit, through quantum physics. And really, this video represents what your life looks like spiritually speaking to God. Let's watch this video. That's you. That's Jesus. (laughs) That's you. That's God. You laugh because it's true. That's you in the bottom right. Come on. Now, that video is called Dad Reflexes, and it's funny because something about being a dad, you just have, you know what I'm talking about? You have that reflex. I have had many stories of my kids falling off something, and somehow this third instinct, just boom, I can catch them right there. But as I watched that, I was thinking, you know, God's our Father, and that really is what you look like to Him. You know, you're like, God, I can do it myself. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to fix my life. And He's constantly catching you and saying, there's my grace. Don't worry. And sometimes you just have to laugh it off. You know, there's a reason He's called our Savior. Uh, Why? Because you needed a Savior. And let me just say this. Even if you're already saved, you still need your Savior every day. Uh, And most of the time, if you're honest, he's saving you from yourself, not the devil, not anything else. It's you. Come on, say it's me. All right. If you can be humble enough to admit that, then you can begin the process of change and success. You know, we're calling this series Get Wisdom. Because I realized something. A lot of times in church and in Christianity and modern Christianity, we focus a lot on faith. And we hear sermons on faith. I teach on faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's the currency exchange in the kingdom of God. If you want to receive from God, you must have faith to receive from him. He says you have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You can't approach God without faith and who he is. But faith must be coupled with wisdom. And a lot of times we try to walk our lives in faith without coupling our faith with wisdom. And a lot of times that's the primary reason we don't see results. I am obsessed to a degree, for a lack of a better word, of discovering why certain people, myself at certain times in my life, don't get results according to God's word. Because I know his word is true, And if you read his word, there are great promises in God's word. If you read the book of Acts, after Jesus died and rose again, it describes how the church should look. And there are things that happen in the book of Acts that we're not seeing like we should be seeing in the church today, by and large, small places around the world. Why is that? And so I'm always reading from that angle. And Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 is our core verse that we read last week, and it says says this in the New King James. Wisdom is the principal thing. Say principal thing. That word, if you remember last week, we said principle means the beginning or it means before all. It also means supreme or first in rank. You know, Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning. That's the same word for the principal thing. 
In the beginning, we'll find out that God used wisdom to create the heavens and the earth. Let me give you my definition of wisdom. Uh, we've all heard it before that wisdom is the application of knowledge, which confuses a lot of people. And uh, it's a good definition, but it's like saying Jesus is our healer. But he's not just our healer. He's our savior. He's our redemption. He's freedom. He's reconciliation. He's all these things. So if you just say wisdom is the application of knowledge, it's one sliver of it. Here's my definition. If you want to write it down. Wisdom is the spiritual ability to navigate this life with precision and success. And I said spiritual ability because it's not a natural wisdom we're talking about. In a moment, you'll see how there's two types of wisdom in God's word. There's man's wisdom, earthly wisdom, which is good to a degree. But the Bible says God's wisdom, the other kind of wisdom, makes man's wisdom look foolish. And so you can have earthly wisdom, but not God's wisdom, and you can still live a defeated life. You know, it's like people who are extremely successful in this life. If you've ever, you know, I mean, you, everyone has a different definition of success. So I'm just talking worldly here. So don't think, Pastor thinks that's success. But I'm talking, think of movie stars, think of professional athletes, think of highly uh, successful business people, think of billionaires and, and CEOs of company and have well, a lot of worldly success. But if you look at most of their lives, and I say most, you will see that there is chaos behind the scenes. They are successful in one area where they have wisdom, earthly wisdom. But they could be successful in business and be terrible and a total failure at home. Marriage is falling apart. Kids hate them. You know, they're lonely. They have no friends. They're depressed. They're isolated. And when you see a public image, you see a smile. You see, you know, red carpet being rolled out. And you think, man, they've really achieved something. But if you live on just man's wisdom, because they have a level of wisdom, they got to where they are because they knew how to navigate successfully in their field. But that's limited. I was talking to someone the other day that's highly, highly successful, uh, one of the most successful people that I know. And I was encouraging this person. And, uh, and I said, you know, you're, you're a professional in this area. I'm a professional in a spiritual area. So listen to me. I know I can't tell you anything about anything about this life that you don't know, but I'm going to go above you for a second. And I said, here's where you need to work on some things. This is where you need to cover yourself. I'm seeing from a different perspective, and this is what you need to be aware of. Because the more you focus on that and achieve here, you have a back door that the enemy would love nothing more than to drain you of all the call of God on your life. And you can say, I've achieved the whole world. What is it for a man to gain the world but lose his soul? And so you have to see the spiritual wisdom from every perspective in your life. So the majority of life's problems, I'm going to leave it generic instead of say your problems, uh, your neighbor's problems, the majority of your neighbor's problems come from a lack of wisdom. Not the devil. Not spiritual warfare. And I know that's shocking to some of you because we've been trained, especially if you're from, you know, a non-denominational background or, you know, a spirit-filled type church background. And, you know, you're like, we've been trained to think, well, everything is all about warfare. And there is a time for spiritual warfare. We talked about it in worship today. But if you would give a percentage to how many problems or issues in our life are to be blamed solely on the enemy operating, it would be a smaller percent, much smaller than the problems or the issues or the hard circumstances that have come from a lack of wisdom. And so as I teach this sermon today, it might not be as exciting to you as other messages. You might not say, man, like, I don't feel like running. And you might feel like crying during this sermon. But I want you to recognize that source of the, all the things the enemy's been trying to do in our life so we can cut them off at the feet. The majority of life's success on the other side comes from wisdom. Now, Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, I'm just going to give a quick quote here. It says, wisdom is justified by her children. That means your life reveals the level of wisdom you operate in. Wisdom can justify itself by its fruit. Jesus said those words. So I can tell you can look on the outside, but I can see if you're using wisdom in areas of your life just from fruit alone. So once again, here's Satan's goal. We're going to get into some things now. His goal is to steal your effectiveness in this life through foolishness. You know, the word fool means simply this, one acting without wisdom. So a fool is somebody who does not use wisdom in their life. That's a pretty harsh statement. Have you ever not used wisdom in your life? Raise your hand if you ever not used wisdom in your life. I'm just going to leave it right there. So um, I'm not talking about the wisdom of this world, though, once again. 
I'm talking about the wisdom of God. Now, we learn something from Adam and Eve from the very beginning of Scripture, and it's this. If you try to become wise without God, then you become a fool. Look at Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 6. It's interesting because the fall of mankind happened over wisdom. Genesis 3, 6 6 says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree, listen to this, desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. They were attempting to become wise outside of their need for God. Well, I want to have what God has. That's the same lie the enemy started with. Satan said, I want that worship. I want to be on that throne. And it's interesting because we would never do that overtly in our life. But your actions sometimes say the same thing. I'm going to try to navigate without God because I feel like I'm wiser than him. I, I can fix this. I can do it on my own. I'm going to make a decision either without God or, this is even more dangerous, in spite of what I know God says. I can't tell you the times I've sat down counseling somebody and said, hey, let me just tell you, as your pastor, I'm not saying I'm always right about everything, but I'm going to tell you this. I know what God is saying. That's not God. Are you submitted to authority in your life to the degree? When I told our pastors we were called to start a church, and I heard God say that, which I didn't want to do, by the way, so they were, like, shocked too, you know. Uh, And I said, I feel like God is saying, uh, Courtney and I went on a fast and believe God's saying to start a church, call it Light's Church. And I said, but if you say, before you react, if you were to tell me that you think I've missed God, I'm going to honor that word above what I feel like I'm hearing and go back to fasting and prayer and make sure I'm hearing God because I'm honoring my authority. And if I don't hear clearly from God, then I'll stay here until I'm 100 years old. Why? Because I'm committed. I'm submitted to authority. So Adam and Eve got outside of God's authority because they were pursuing what God had already provided for them. I'm going to show you in a second that wisdom, this is so deep and powerful, if you can catch this. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree God said don't eat from. Why? Because God did not want them. It's not that he didn't want them to know but good between right and wrong. I used to get confused by that. Why would God not want them to know the knowledge of good and evil? When we need to know what's evil, we need to know what's good. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and the knowledge or experience of good and experience, experiential knowledge of evil. Wisdom is the knowledge of good from evil. And Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good, of good and evil. That means they have now experienced darkness in their life. They have working relationship with knowledge. They have seen light and they have now connected to darkness. And wisdom is the ability to recognize evil and to recognize good and the ability to navigate around darkness or evil and stay in the will of God for your life. So it was important that she did not partake of the experience of evil. And God said, now you've been polluted. Now, last week, real quick, I gave you uh, a few points of what the purpose of wisdom for our lives is. And I wanted you to see your need for wisdom, what it does, so you could see this week We're going to talk about how to get wisdom. And the first part of last week's sermon, number one, was God provides for us through wisdom. We we learned last week, we're going to see again in Proverbs 8 and um, many other scriptures, God created the heavens and the earth through wisdom. I used to teach God created it through faith, but I, I saw it wasn't true in scripture. God used faith, but wisdom creates by using the material of faith. And sometimes we try to walk by faith, like I said in the beginning, without wisdom. Whereas wisdom teaches you how to use faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, this is deep. You have to write it down and read it later. It says faith is the material, the substance. So if you don't have the wisdom to utilize the faith, the substance to create by faith, then you're not going to be able to see results, which is my age-old question. Why aren't we seeing results? So wisdom is the principal thing before all. Before you try to walk by faith, you need to be seeking wisdom. Let God show you how to walk by faith. Instead of asking God for what, ask him how. So number one, he provides for us through wisdom. I wrote it like this. Instead of asking God to give you something, ask God to show you something. That's a wise prayer. 
Not, Lord, give me more money. Help me in this area. Do this for me. Say, God, show me how to get more money. Show me how to be successful. Show me how to be a better husband, a better father, a better mother, a better employee, a better sister, a better son, a better daughter. Show me how, not just, Lord, fix this for me. Because when we pray, Lord, fix this for me, we are not growing and maturing, and there's probably a great uh, chance that we will not see results from that prayer. Because God's saying, you're praying amiss, Scripture says. You're asking for the wrong thing. So if you're not getting results or answers to your prayers, ask God this. Am I asking the wrong thing? I've been praying for this for 15 years, and I hadn't seen anything, not even a glimpse that this is going to happen or it's you. And it might just be God says you're focused on the wrong thing. Ask me how. Seek me. Take a left right here. Focus here. That will follow you when you magnify that. If you're magnifying the gift instead of the giver, you'll never get the gift. Because he delivers the gift. That's good preaching if you, you don't say it, I will. Okay, number two, God leads us with wisdom. So one, he provides. Number two, he leads us with wisdom. This is last week. We learned in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 13 that the Holy Spirit uses wisdom to lead us in our life and guide us. Number three, God delivers us with wisdom. And we learned that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were all delivered because of the wisdom that was in their life that God gave them. In James 1, we talked about on this point here, deliverance, that it says, uh, be joyful. Count it all joy when you fall into trials and tribulations, which is a confusing scripture. And in the middle of that, talking about a trial that you're in, he says, if you need wisdom, let him ask of God. It's funny, he didn't say, if you need a miracle in the trial, ask for a miracle. He said, if you need wisdom. And one of the primary things we learned last week is that wisdom will get you through any trouble. If you're looking for a miracle and you're not getting it, it might be because God's trying to give you the wisdom to get your miracle. And you can't ask for the apple. You can get one apple. But if you can get an apple tree, you can have unlimited apples in your life. And God wants you to grow up spiritually to where you're not always needing someone to get an apple for you or whatever you need, but you now know how to get it from God and to walk with him and to see apples in your life. Is that making sense? It's the difference of walking just by faith and faith and wisdom. Number four, God prepares us with wisdom. We're going to go into that some more today, but wisdom is seeing the future. Fools are nearsighted. You're being foolish when you're looking at what's in front of your face. And in the worship today, I had that word for you, and I said, look, if you're just looking at what's right in front of you, you're magnifying that. The stronghold that's in your mind is because you're looking nearsighted. I mean, you know, I don't know how many of you wear glasses or contacts in here. I wear contacts, uh, but I wore glasses for many years. It's funny looking at old pictures, man. Like back in the late 80s, early 90s, I had those ugly, like, 80s glasses, you know. I was like, we're going to get contacts. And I remember the first time I put contacts on, I was amazed, like, because my glasses were also, like, all out, and I had bent them all up, and I think they were the wrong prescription, you know, and I was just, like, rough with my glasses, and I never wanted to go to the eye doctor. And I remember putting contacts on, and for the first time in my life, Everything was clear. I could see a cross. I was in a mall at this eye doctor, and I was just shocked. I was like, is this how the world sees? Like, I always thought people saw kind of blurry. Like, I didn't know that you could see clearly with that. Sounds like a song. Um, But when you're acting foolish, you're taking off your glasses, if you will, and you're nearsighted, and everything becomes blurry in front of you. Without my glasses, I mean, the big, what is it, the... uh, what is the thing on top of the thing you're looking at? What letter is it? I always forget. Yeah, because I can't see it. <laughs> it's the E, right? Literally can't see the E on top. That's, that's me. Okay, so pray for me. But with, with contacts, I'm fine. But the point is, is we begin, I can look at something close very well. And if you become nearsighted in your walk with God, you're going to be moved by every wind of doctrine. You're going to be moved by every circumstance. And your emotions are going to be like this. Because the enemy can throw pictures across your face all day long, situations. But if you can look past the drama, static, and see the big picture, then you can walk by wisdom. Very important. And then number five, wisdom brings success. We learned that well last week. All right, let's go into this week now. We're going to move quickly here. Proverbs chapter 8. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 8 with me. This is the wisdom chapter. And it's really neat because if you've never read Proverbs chapter 8, you'll be shocked to see how much of a role wisdom has had in creation. We're going to start in verse 12, Proverbs 8, verse 12. 
We're going to read 12 and 13 first. It says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. Now, the reason we're reading verse 12 is I want you to see that wisdom is talking. So everything after this in verse 12 is wisdom speaking. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. So wisdom is speaking here. In a minute, we're going to see, you might have heard the scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then here we see that the fear of the Lord is hating evil. So hating evil is the beginning of wisdom. Very important to know that. Now let's go to verse 21 here. This is where it gets good. This is where wisdom starts affecting your life. Verse 21. Wisdom is speaking, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth that I may fill their treasuries. If you walk in wisdom, you will inherit wealth, Scripture says. You will increase earthly. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me wisdom at the beginning of his way before his works of old, before he created the heavens and the earth. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, he's saying, wisdom is saying, all of this was happening. Verse 30, I was beside him as a master craftsman. Wisdom is saying, I was the master craftsman. Now that's an interesting word because wisdom is saying, I was taking what God was saying and I was crafting everything God was saying. So wisdom actually, God, we're gonna find out in a moment, wisdom is a person. Wisdom says, I was taking the faith that God was releasing through words, and I was making that substance into everything God wanted to see. So wisdom created the stars. Wisdom created the earth that we're on. Wisdom created everything in this earth, the chair you're sitting on, the stage I'm on, the lights above your head. Wisdom is at the foundation of all physical, material things. And that's why I don't want to get too deep here, but I'm going to throw it in for free, not in my notes. Daniel 12 says, in the last days, knowledge and wisdom will increase before Christ returns in the very last days. We are in an accelerated wisdom and knowledge increase in this generation. Over the last hundred years, more inventions have been invented in the last hundred years than all of mankind's history combined in the last 100 years. We've seen airplanes, we've seen cars, we've seen modern medicine and quantum physics, and we've gone to the moon and all of these things. There's an increase of knowledge and wisdom. And here's what's amazing. If wisdom's at the core of all material things, then as we grow, this is earthly wisdom too, as we grow in wisdom, mankind, on understanding material things, that wisdom is unfolded and then we can utilize and create with the same things that God created with, just with earthly wisdom. I mean, we are now doing things that a 1,000 years ago would have been just mind-blowing. I mean, 200 years ago, if you would have told somebody that we'd have these little boxes in our pocket that can connect to the entire world and talk to anyone even thousands of miles away in a second and, and see people, even if they're physically not with us, they wouldn't even believe you. It's, it's crazy to think that way. What if... We knew what was going to come in the next 50 years, and I told you that right now. Imagine you saying, there's no way that's possible. That's where we're headed. And the reason Jesus is coming soon is because just like the Tower of Babel, there is a, such a rapid increase of knowledge and wisdom that uh, the darkness in this earth, God is going to come back before we can really destroy ourselves. Because we are now learning in science, I, I'm a science nerd, things that should not happen. I mean, they have now figured out how to merge the DNA of humans and animals. And they actually have prototypes, if you will, that they've had to destroy in the embryo stage because uh, it's illegal. I mean, we're playing with things that are on a level that we shouldn't be playing with. And so, we'll leave it at that. There's always something deep in every sermon for you to go read about later, okay? So, what I want you to see is wisdom created all these things. Now, if wisdom created the natural world the master craftsman, then I'm going to say it like this. If wisdom created the world, then there's nothing that wisdom can't create in your life. 
So instead of asking God to just hand you something, because I feel like most of our walk with God is about something we need, and we, we just want it to rain from the heavens. I mean, if we're honest, our prayers, it's all magical the way we see God. Like, God, uh, I need, I use money because it's a very practical example. Lord, I don't have enough money here. I need a miraculous financial miracle. And we think an airplane's going to drop a bag of money or it's going to grow on trees or some angel's going to walk up and say, I'm delivering this to you to pay your rent. And I'm not saying God never does those things because he does a lot. But God's primary way is wisdom. Miracles are the backup plan. You need a miracle because you have a crisis. <laughs> My spiritual father always says, Christ is in the crisis. You know, like if you really recognize something, the crisis is happening because you didn't recognize Christ and you were walking foolish a lot of times. And if you would recognize, hey, wait a second, I need a miracle right now. So God, I need something to happen. Jesus did miracles all the time. But what if you could live a life that would navigate yourself successfully where you wouldn't need as many miracles? I mean, that's the ultimate goal. So wisdom governs the natural world. Faith governs the supernatural world. I'll say it again. Wisdom governs or controls the natural realm. Faith is the supernatural world's governor or controller. A lot of Christians, once again, are trying to use faith without wisdom. Now, I'm really laying this foundation because I'm going to say things today that I think you're going to learn a lot, and I want to make sure we're on the same page. Natural problems are not always from a lack of faith but usually they're from a lack of wisdom. Natural problems are not always from a lack of faith. Most likely they're from a lack of wisdom. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Very interesting scripture here. 1 Corinthians 15, 46 says, It is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. Once again, 1 Corinthians 15, 46. It's not the spiritual that's first, if I didn't read this out of the Bible, you'd think I messed up in my sermon. The spiritual is not first, he says, but the natural. Then the spiritual. The first Adam was natural. The second Adam, Jesus, spiritual, supernatural. What is God telling us here? There is natural preparation that takes place before spiritual manifestation. And a lot of times we want the spiritual thing to happen, but we're not willing to first deal with the natural thing. First, wisdom governs the natural world. And so what if you can deal with the natural first and you're setting yourself up for a supernatural visitation from God? And we want to do what we want, live how we want, and then say, God, fix it. And God says, wait a second, if you, if you would put this in order, all the other things would happen. I always use diet as an example because it's just my struggle. Let me just be honest, okay? And, like, you can not like the way you look. And you can ask God for a miracle to change the way you look. I'm always sucking in, and I hate it. If I let it out now, you'd all laugh. So I just get tired of sucking in. I'm like, you know, Lord, and I just, like, God, and I have all these complaints. And I must like sucking in because I haven't done anything about it naturally. Now, I'm just using eating, for example, because eating is my hobby. Okay, so if I switched eating from a different hobby and something else, then I probably wouldn't deal with that. But what I'm telling you is God's saying, deal with the natural first. If you're, if you're believing God for a new car, I know this doesn't sound spiritual, clean out your garage. Like set natural things in motion, and you naturally, when you do that first, God says, now I can put the supernatural on it. But if you're not doing all you can do in the natural, then you're not doing your part. And so, God, I need you to bless me financially. Great prayer right there. But if you're not using wisdom financially now, God cannot bless you financially because you'll squander that and be in a worse place. You've seen people win the lottery, and they say, I don't know, like 90% of them end up poor like months later. Why? They, they don't have the wisdom to handle it. And so a lot of times you might not be promoting or getting something in your life that you're expecting or wanting because God says you don't have the wisdom to handle that yet. And I love you too much to put that on you without the wisdom to navigate that. So let me say, wisdom maintains what faith receives. Wisdom maintains what faith receives from God. So, you know, you can receive a miracle of healing. We believe in healing. I've seen miracles of healing. But you have to know how to maintain your healing as well. There's things you have to do. I remember in prayer a few years ago, um, I um, did not like some things, uh, medical things, and this was in my 20s. 
some heart things or whatever that when I went to the doctor, they were saying, wow, that's not, you're pretty young to have that kind of levels of that. And I didn't like that. And I was like, God, you know, just want to blame the devil or something. You know, I was like, what's going on? This is warfare. God said, no, your hobby's eating. And you're not eating all the right things. And then wisdom spoke to me. And wisdom said, and this is me. I'm not saying pastor said this for you and then you didn't work. Or, this is my little like thing, like this is what God told me. And I know I'm just going to tell you because it sounds weird. I didn't even know about this. And the Lord said, I want you to start taking krill oil. And I was like, krill oil, okay. And then he said, I, you need to take, if you're not going to eat constantly green, then I want you to take green. I said, okay. If you do that, you will subvert things in the future in your life. That's wisdom speaking. Natural. So what do I do? I take krill oil, and I take green things, and I eat green things. Why? Because wisdom says do it now so you don't need a miracle in 30 years. And so it's not exciting because it's practical in a lot of ways, but I'm telling you, it's, it will deliver your life. Because I think a lot of times we're always trying to push it off on a spiritual problem instead of going, wait a second, what is wisdom saying now? Wisdom says how to handle your money. Don't be frivolous in your spending. Learn wisdom on how to invest. Wisdom says, are you investing in your marriage? Don't wait till you need a miracle in your marriage. Are you investing in it now? Are you listening to your spouse and they say, this is what I need? Are you fighting for it? Are you getting what you need? Or are you ignoring the problem now because it will become a greater problem later? Okay, I'm going to move past because y'all aren't happy with me. All right, so natural preparation before spiritual. So once again, the, the spiritual is not first. The natural is. Let me say it like this. If the natural life, your, your earthly life, is perpendicular to your spiritual life, that means they're going in different directions. Natural life's going this way. God is going this way. Then you're going to be in need of miracles and have crisis in your life. If your earthly life, your natural life, is parallel, in unison, going in the same direction as God's word and as God is, then you will not need miracles. You will stay in victory. And so I want to see you live a life that goes from victory to victory, not from miracle to miracle. That's the whole point of what I'm trying to say on this here. So faith is how we receive from God once again. Wisdom's how we maintain the thing that we receive from God. Faith takes things from the supernatural realm and brings it into the earthly realm. And wisdom manages or stewards these spiritual assets, if you will. So last week I was trying to get you to see the importance of wisdom in your life. You must have wisdom to fulfill your destiny. Once again, Proverbs 4, 7 this is the international standard version in Proverbs 4, 7. I love the way it says it. It says, wisdom is of utmost importance. Utmost importance. Therefore, get wisdom. So what is your job? You can say it out loud. Get wisdom. Here's what God says. Utmost importance, your job is to get wisdom. That means it's not automatic. So what I'm about to teach you as we get ready to close here is I'm going to teach you how to get wisdom if that's what God says you're supposed to do. Because Scripture tells us clearly how to live in wisdom and how to receive wisdom. And it's important that you know that because you can know you need it and you can even want it a lot, but it doesn't mean you'll have wisdom. There, there are five clear ways in Scripture, and there could be more that I haven't discovered yet or heard, but these are five primary ways that we get wisdom. And before I give you the first one, we're going to get it from the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. Solomon had more wisdom, the Bible says, than anyone before him and anyone after him. No one's ever attained to the level of wisdom and understanding that Solomon had. So what did he do? How did he qualify? How did Solomon, the wealthiest man who ever lived? Don't, all these new History Channel shows, I watch a lot of history TV and science TV, and they're trying to say other people have been wealthier. And so, no, mm -mm, no, because they got wealthy in the world's way. If God makes you wealthy and says you're the wealthiest that ever lived, then you're the wealthiest that's ever lived. The Queen of Sheba one of the wealthiest people on earth came and was shocked at the clothing of Solomon's servants. That would be like Elon Musk coming to your house and, and dumbfounded and speechless at your dog collars that you had on. The wealthiest man on earth was going, who are you? I thought I knew what wealth was. He was on a higher level. So how did Solomon acquire this wisdom? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Here's point number one on how to get wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Number one, fear God. Fear God. Now, this is not a popular sermon today. Fear God. 
Now, this word fear doesn't mean be afraid of like in a dark way like a horror movie. This word fear means reverence. It also means preference or to prefer. It means honor. A fear of the Lord to where you know the might of the God that you serve. And there's a little fear there of this is not a God that's to be played with. This is not a God who when he says something can be taken lightly. And this God who I fear, is the only God, and I reverence him, and he is preeminent in my life. It means to honor him alone. Not honor God and honor things. No, honor him alone. To fear God means to live for the approval of God alone. If you can get to that point, it'll set you free. You'll be happy forever. Most of our unhappiness is we're trying to get something from somebody, and we're mad when we don't. And if you're trying to get something from another human being, then you're going to be controlled by humans and not led by God. That, that right there is a whole book you should write, and you don't have to give me credit. Just receive that revelation. Because we live for the approval of others without realizing it. I mean, social media is a testament to that. I mean, when you get dressed in the morning, are you getting dressed just for yourself? Or you're like, man, I got to look good. You know, well, if you're single, I understand that. Okay, but, you know, but even if you're married, you want to look good for your spouse, or you just want to look excellent, or you want to command attention or respect, or you hold yourself a certain way, or you want people to see you a certain way. And if we're not careful, our whole life can be framed by whatever the situation wants of us, we are trying to become that. And there's wisdom in that. I mean, you don't want to just walk into a room and totally destroy the moment and stand out everywhere you go and be a total goofball. But if God's pleasure is not your priority, then you don't fear him. You fear whoever you're trying to please. The fear of the Lord, once again, is the beginning of wisdom. Now, let me say something a little bit different here. That means the fear of anything else is the end of wisdom. If the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then if you fear anything else but God, you are now at the end of wisdom, and you are now forfeiting wisdom in your life. What does it mean to fear anything else but God? It means anything else in worship today. We talked about it, strongholds. What you fear will stay at the forefront of your mind. We are wired. Our flesh nature, our fallen nature is wired to pre-play and replay the wrong thing. I'm going to fail, I just know it, or I did fail, or I can't believe I did that, or why did that happen? And if we're all honest, we'll agree, we all deal with that. I mean, when you lay down at night, go to bed, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to, at some point, the problem's going to go across your mind, or what you don't have, or what you're frustrated about, or what you're struggling with, and you're tempted to just magnify that in your thinking, and give that everything, because you fear that thing. You don't want that to be the case, or the truth, or to come to pass in your life. And if you fear that, you cannot walk in wisdom at the same time. Because you can't fear things, problems, people, the devil, and fear God at the same time. So, practice fearing the Lord above all else. I don't care what they say, what the economy says, what the doctor's saying. I know what God has said, and I know he's all-powerful. And I'm going to line up with what God has said. And your emotions will follow, sometimes not immediately, sometimes it takes weeks. But if you make a decision to fear the Lord and to not magnify the issue, your emotions will catch up, and you'll have happiness. You'll walk in joy. That's your strength. So fear of God is number one. What does the fear of the Lord look like? Solomon. I said we're going to learn from him. This is so good. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Second Chron- I know you all want to win prizes, and we're going to have lunch in a second. But this is so powerful here. Let's look at when Solomon received all this wisdom, the greatest level of wisdom any person's ever had except for Christ himself. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, I'm going to read in verse 1 through 12 here. This is right after David, Solomon's father, passed away. And now Solomon is taking the reins as the king. Verse 1, now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. And Solomon spoke to all of Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to every leader in all of Israel, the heads of the father's houses. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon. For the tabernacle of the meeting with God was there, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. Verse 4. 
David had brought up the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. I'm going to not say it the Hebrew way because you all laugh and you understand it. To the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made, he put before the tabernacle, my contacts are fogging up, I just talked about them, of the Lord Solomon, and the assembly sought him there. Verse 6, and Solomon went up there. Now this is important. Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Man, I get goosebumps saying it because if you understand what that means. Verse 7, on that night, what night? The night he offered a thousand sacrifices. God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask, what shall I give you? Can you imagine God stepping out of heaven ignoring all the angels worship for a second saying everyone pause for a minute i gotta go do something and the god of the universe stops and bends down to you and says hang on a second ask me just say anything whatever you say whatever you want i'll do it for you what is it wow i mean we watch movies about genies and think that would be cool the god of the universe is saying ask me anything and i'll do it for you what in the world did solomon do to deserve that verse 8 and Solomon said to God, man, Solomon's winning on these, this moment here. Uh, you have shown great mercy to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David, my father, be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may know, that I may go out and come in before your people. Who can judge this great people of yours? Now, once again, Solomon didn't say, who can judge the people of mine? He said, who could judge your people? There's a reason why I say I'm not the pastor of this church. I'm the associate pastor. God is. God's your pastor. I'm just doing whatever he says. I'm your earthly pastor. But he's the the great shepherd. When you recognize that, that everything you have is not yours, it's God's, then God's responsible to take care of it. If you think it's yours, then God will let you deal with it, but you're going to mess it up. Like that video, that's you. I can do it, Daddy. No, you know, like, you're always doing that if we're honest, right? So it's God's. He said, it's yours. Now, verse 6 and 7 says, Solomon went up to the high place and offered a 1,000 burnt offerings. He was commanded to offer one. One sacrifice. And he offered a 1,000 personally. Just think through practically how much work that would take. This is not like you read it and go, wow, that's pretty cool. That didn't just take like 15 minutes. This could have took weeks. A thousand animals that had to be slaughtered properly, according to the law, dealt with, and then, or well, a thousand had to be picked, and they had to be special. They can't just be any animal. So you had to go through all the flocks, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals, because this is the king we're talking about. He didn't just have three goats in his backyard hundreds of thousands of animals. They had to go through and find the ones that qualify to be sacrificed, a thousand of them. Could have took three weeks just to do that. And then they had to bring them one by one, put them on the altar, and sacrifice them one by one a thousand times. This could have taken, taken, took, I don't know, six months. Who knows? Think about the dedication and the love that Solomon had for God that he did a thousand times more than was asked of him. That'd be like a modern-day equivalent of like, you know, you saying, yeah, I know the tithe is 10 percent, but I'm going to give a thousand times the tithe. I mean, just think about that. That'd be like saying, yeah, I want to serve in kids ministry, but, you know, up at a thousand times. I'm going to work 300 hours a week just serving kids. I mean, we can't even imagine that today. I mean, just the amount of dedication. I'm not saying if you don't do that, you're not blessed like Solomon. Don't hear me wrong, okay, because we have visitors. But I'm saying the heart behind his love for God. Let's just say two or three months of doing this over and above. David, his father, did the same thing. When it was time to provide for the tabernacle, David didn't just say, we're going to take from the kingdom's treasury. He said he took from his own treasury. And the amount of gold and silver he took has a modern-day equivalent of $6 billion of David's own money that he gave to the temple. That's more than 10%. He He was extravagant in his love for God. Solomon, same heart. God was so shocked by those thousand offerings that he stepped out of heaven and said, not because he needed a thousand animals, it was Solomon's heart that was so turned towards God. He said, the eyes of the Lord, 2 Chronicles 16, 1, I think it is, or 7, or anyways, it says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. 
God's eyes are scanning the earth constantly, looking for a heart that's loyal or dedicated to him. And on that person, he will show himself strong, Scripture says. So God's not looking for talent. He's not looking for good looks or for all the qualifications or for having, being born on the right side of the tracks. He's looking for a heart that's loyal to him. And he said, I found one in Solomon. I mean, he probably brought God to tears. You know, God has emotions. We see it all in Scripture. God probably said, I can't believe this. Michael, I thought your worship was good, but man, like Solomon just outdid all of y'all. So pause the worship for a second. Somebody just beats you. I'm, Solomon, whatever you want, I'll give you everything. doesn't matter. I mean, just think of how God loves us like a father. Man, when my boys please me and they do the right thing sometimes when I don't ask, man, they're, they're starting to learn that now. We're teaching them. And one of the things we're talking about is notice others besides yourself. Come on, anyone young, actually humans in general, where we kind of naturally only think about ourselves and there's a bigger world. Come on, how many of your parents ever told you the world doesn't revolve around you? Let's just be honest. Some of you... Never mind. So, and I'm teaching the boys. I'm like, boys, the world doesn't revolve around you. I think sometimes in a younger generation, there's this mentality of like what I want matters and what I think should happen is the most important. Like no one else has opinions. And I'm like, think about your parents. Think about your friends first. And it's so cool because Austin will do some things sometime and Cole as well where he'll, he'll just come and he'll, he'll like stop Courtney when she's walking. He'll go over to her side of the door and he'll open the car door for her and go, here you go, mom. I love you. And he'll come in there to me, and I'll be sitting on the couch or something, and he'll be like, Dad, you, you, you don't have a drink. Are you thirsty? You want me to get you some tea or something? You like tea, right? I know you like extra ice. I'm like, what, are you, what, what is happening? You know, like, what do you want? Anything you want. Because I see that he's not doing it for things. He, there's like a true heart. I just love you. And I'll ask him sometimes, like, what do you want? I'll just do it. I'm like, Dad, I just want to get you something. Imagine God who loves you more than we could even comprehend. All he wants is a heart that says, Lord, everything. You get a thousand of it. I don't care because you're my source. And here's the cool thing. God's already freaked out by this. And then he says, what do you want? And Solomon says, Lord, I just want to lead your people better. I want to do you justice. I want to make sure I steward the most precious thing, the apple of your eye, your people that gives honor to your name, Lord. Just give me wisdom and understanding so I can see them like you see them. And God's like, I mean, I don't know if you could shock God, but I feel like this scripture kind of like at least gives us a feeling of God's reaction to this. And God said, okay, you, a thousand offerings because you love me. And now you could have asked, and this is in the Bible, for wisdom. I mean, you could ask for money. You could have asked for long life. You could have asked for all, anything you wanted, because I would have done it. He could have said, I want to live 3,000 years. And God would have said, done, granted. He could have said, I want to be able to fly. If I was younger, I probably would have asked for that. How many of y'all had dreams like that? I have a recurring dream. I know some of you think this is funny. My bo- I told my boys, and they laughed at me. So I'm going to tell you, don't laugh, but I just want you to know a dream of mine, if anyone can help me accomplish this. I've always wanted to dunk a basketball. It's my dream to be able to dunk a basketball. And I actually have a recurring dream my whole life that I not only can dunk, but I'm one of the best dunkers in the world. And in my dream, I can get like where the rim is at my waist. Like I can come over the rim and dunk. And I'm not being funny, I'm not making this up. Have any of you ever had a dream that you wake up and it's still, you think it's true? When I had that particular dream, the first few seconds when I wake up, it's actual reality. I'm like, I, I've done it. Like I can actually dunk. And I've never been happier in my life until I realized it was a dream. And then I get sad. So I don't know why I told you that, but it's a lifelong dream of mine. Maybe I should just work out. There you go. You don't want it bad enough. Okay. I was saying something. Oh, Solomon said, Lord, give me wisdom. And God said, now, remember what I said earlier? When you're seeking the right thing, you're praying not amiss, but you're praying and you're valuing what God wants you to value. All those things, they'll catch up to you. Sounds like Matthew 6, 33 again. <laughs> Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. So what did Solomon do? He didn't need anyone to teach him that. He just said, I love you so much, God. I just want you and I want to do what you want me to do is the best I can to honor you, Lord. And he said, okay, every single thing I could ever give you comes with that now because you didn't ask. You will have more money than anyone before you and anyone after you. You will have more wisdom than anyone before you and anyone after you. You will have power and prestige such as the world will never see again and has never seen before. That's God being pleased with somebody. So wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. Now here's the end of point one. Wisdom 
remains as long as you maintain the fear of the Lord. Solomon had one of the hardest endings to any life as well. Why is that? Because Solomon turned from the fear of the Lord to the fear of women. And he liked them. And he decided to have women that God said you shouldn't have. And he was pursuing women that were not those that God said. And he was, he was outside of the covenant with God. And he was now allowing idolatry. And he was allowing these girlfriends of his. He had a lot, by the way, like a thousand. You notice how he had a thousand? And he gave God a thousand? The fear of the Lord had been laid aside in his life. Because it's easy to get comfortable. There's a reason Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Not because money stops you. It's because when you're comfortable in life, you can rest in that. And when you don't need God, you put God on the shelf. And it's vital, not just being rich, but if you're ever in an easy season of life, make sure that your faith is staying sharp. That your walk with God is sharp. Don't relax your walk with God just because you don't have a crisis. Because when you seek him just because you love him, not because you need something from him, that's when he goes, ask what you will. That's all God wants. He created Adam and Eve. I just want you to want me. I want relationship. I can give myself anything but relationship. God is God. He's all powerful. He needs nothing, but he wants relationship with you. And everything he's done in scripture through all human history is just to have relationship with you. And we messed it up, and God fixed it and died himself on a cross just to restore relationship with you. Like, that should show how much he loves you. So, Solomon lost the fear of the Lord. He turned from it, allowed these women to put high places, idolatry, and he had a great fall. And Solomon, at the end of his life, realizes and turns back and sees the vanity. And now, in, in the midst of his wrong decisions, he actually increased in wisdom when he turned back to God. Because now he doesn't have wisdom just in all the areas of understanding, but he has wisdom of life itself because he's seen both sides of life. And he says, man, without staying with him, all of this is vanity. He knows what really matters now. So what's important to you? Fear God. How do we get wisdom? Number two, seek it. Seek it. I took too long on that, so let's move through this. Seek it. The voice of wisdom is not heard easily. You've got to seek wisdom. Proverbs 1.20 says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. So wisdom is constantly crying out, but people aren't hearing the voice of wisdom in our life. You have to ask for wisdom and seek it in your life. It's not automatic. Remember earlier I told you there's two types of wisdom. There's man's wisdom and there's God's wisdom. And Eve was trying to have self-sufficient wisdom outside of God's. And in that moment, she now knew evil and not the difference between good and evil. Why? Because she was seeking earthly wisdom. So when we seek wisdom, how do we get it? It's received through relationship with God. It's found in his presence. Jeremiah 33.3 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you knowest not. Colossians 2.3 says, In whom, speaking of Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you have Christ and you're in relationship with him, you have wisdom. It's in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1.30, for the sake of time, I won't read it. It says that Jesus not only has wisdom, here you go, Jesus is wisdom, the Bible says. He has been made unto us wisdom. So he's saying, seek me. Ask me for wisdom. Solomon sought the Lord, a thousand, whatever, God, I just want you. I just want to please you, Lord. And God said, you got me, all the wisdom that comes with it, and everything else that you could have asked for. How do we get wisdom? We seek it. Number one, fear the Lord. Number two, seek it. Number three, do the word. Not shocking, but it's easier to preach than it is to, to practice. Do the word. Psalm 19.7 says this, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. And the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Proverbs 19.7, God's decrees, his word makes wise the simple. Wisdom is applying the word to your life. I'm not going to read this portion of scripture, but you can read it later. Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. It's a story of building the man who built his house on the sand and the man who built his house on the rock. And it's the man who built his house on the rock is the wise man, the Bible says, and the man who built himself on the sand, his house on the sand, is the foolish man. And the guy who built himself, 
his house on the rock is the man who did the word. The foolish man heard the word and didn't do it. So what I'm saying today and what you see in God's word, you can hear it and agree with it, and it does nothing for you until you actually submit and do it. And it's, it sounds simple, but we can agree with something and not actually submit to it and not know we're doing that. It's like, oh, yeah, God says to do that. Yeah, that's in his word. God told us to do that. But you're not doing it. It's like, yeah, I know what I should be eating, and that would really help me. Why, why God? Why, do I, why is nothing changing? Why is not, Because you got to do it. Okay, let's keep moving here. Uh, number four, you surround yourself. How to get wisdom? Surround yourself with wise people and wise counsel. This is huge. And not just surrounding yourself with wisdom, but submitting to the wisdom that you surround yourself with. If you don't have at least one person in your life that you would say is in authority spiritually, That doesn't mean they control you and tell you what to do. It means there's someone in your life that has authority that you've given or a voice, and really it needs to be more. I have more than one person in my life that can come to you and say anything, and you're going to take it before, even if it hurts or you don't like it, you're going to receive it, and if you don't understand it, you're going to bring it to the Lord, not with the attitude of, man, I don't know what they're thinking. God, they're wrong, aren't they? No, If, if my authority says that, there's truth to it. Lord, how can I fix this? What do I need to do to correct this in my life? I had one of my spiritual fathers sit me down one time and just told me everything that was wrong with my character. And it wasn't one-on-one. It was in a, a, a Bible study with other guys, other leaders. And he pointed each one of us out in this meeting and told us what was wrong with our character in front of everybody and didn't tell us what he was doing. And I was like the second one. And I knew after they started on the first guy, I'm like, Lord, I'm sitting next to this dude. Oh, don't tell me this. How- I can use the restroom. I'll be back. And he said, I love you but you're prideful and this and this. And then he came to me and he said, you have an independent spirit and you think this and you think, and man, he hit me with so much and I was like, I didn't know if to cry or get mad or what. And he went through the whole thing. And then afterwards he went through each of us and told us our gifts and what's amazing about us and all these things. Then he said, you always need to have this voice in your life as God promotes you. If you're too big to hear correction, then you're too big for your britches. And a man wrapped up in himself makes a small package, they say. So... You need to be submitted to authority. Who around you is wise? Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. One of my favorite scriptures here at the end, Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Before you make any important decisions in your life, you need to have a multitude of counselors. And don't make an emotional decision or react to a circumstance without submitting to counsel in your life. I feel this way, but what do you say? Lord, what do you say? What does the counsel in your life say? And God will speak through them every time. Number five, last one, how to get wisdom. Get the right perspective. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What is God saying? When you get the right perspective of your life, wisdom comes with it. Remember earlier I said nearsighted? That's the wrong perspective. You're just looking at what's in front of you, the moment, the emotion, the feeling, the situation. But when you get the right perspective of your purpose, the big picture, wisdom follows that. So how to get wisdom? Cause yourself to see from God's perspective, stop in every situation, every crisis, and go, wait, what does this look from an eternal perspective? What really matters here? Yes, I can react this way, but it's really going to turn out to bless them and bless me and make this a godly situation, or is it going to exacerbate the problem? Get God's perspective. Now, last scripture I'm going to read, and one of my favorites of this sermon. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. Last scripture. Everyone stand up if you would, because I don't want to lose you all. You look tired. Okay, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. This is the New Living Translation. Remember, this is Solomon's wisdom now. In verse 6, he says... Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones, or you lazy people. Man, this is a a good way to start a sermon. Learn from their ways and become wise. So Solomon's saying, look, you're acting foolish. If you can learn from the ants, you will become wise. What is he saying? Verse 7. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer. This is the key. Gathering food for the winter. So Solomon is saying, here's wisdom with the ants. They are working hard in the summer when they don't need it. They're focusing on what seems foolish at the time, doesn't seem needed. 
because they're seeing their perspective is winter's coming. And they know we have to provide and store up in a time that we will not have. Joseph did the same thing. The wisdom hand said, let's store grain now before the famine. Wisdom is always seeing the big picture, seeing the future. And he said, and they gather food for the winter. So the ant provides during the summer when everything is in abundance. Noah, the story of Noah's ark, same thing. No rain, didn't make sense. He's building an ark. People are laughing at him. He's building an ark. The wise virgins and the foolish virgins in the parable of Matthew 25, the ones that were wise were preparing and getting their oil ready before they needed it, before the bridegroom came. The foolish ones were nearsighted, and they were in the moment. And they were partying and didn't know, and they were surprised when the bridegroom came. Wise children of God are not going to be surprised at the return of Christ. And if you weren't here on our Wednesday prophecy series a while back, we're going to have more of those, but I believe we're in that time. So what are the ants saying, teaching us? Be willing to look like a fool today because you value tomorrow. Some of the smartest people are valuing what other people don't value. Be busy getting ready for something that you don't need right now. What in your life are you responding to? Are you responding to the moment or are you responding to your destiny? Because some of you have decisions in front of you that you'll make that's going to alter the course of your life. And if you respond emotionally or out of anger, out of frustration, or taking the easy route, the easy way is never God's way. Can I just tell you that? I'm not 100 years old, but I've seen a lot of lives in ministry. I've learned in my life that if it seems to be the easy way, I guarantee it's not God. Why? Because you don't need him. God says, no, you walk by faith, not by comfort. And so if that's easy, it's probably you. Some of you have dreams and visions that are huge. Your destiny is beyond you. But you need to respond to your destiny and not react to your circumstance in this season. Because if you react to your circumstance, you're going to sabotage your destiny. And I've met with some of you, and I've been praying and seeing there's an attack happening in many lives in this season, not just in our church, but around the body of Christ. And we are at a fork in the road. You're either going to take God's way and get serious and do whatever it takes and humble yourself to change, or you're going to sabotage what God's attempting to do in your life, and you're going to go around the mountain for 40 years. And I'm going to tell you, take humility. Fear the Lord, not anything else. And wisdom will speak to you in that. Come on, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Today I was talking about what God has told us to do to pursue what he wants us to have. And it's not about the things. It's about the heart of God, the perspective of God and the wisdom of God. And the first thing we have to learn of how to get wisdom is to fear the Lord. And I just want you to take inventory as we close out this service in your life. Fear is to reverence, to put preeminent first place, to give priority to. Does God have priority in your life? Is his opinion, is his needs, is his kingdom's needs, is God's will your priority, your focus, your passion, or is something else in the way? Are you fearing the enemy? Or are you fearing others, which means you're living to please someone else? Because the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Your heart towards him needs to be blameless. I didn't say your actions are always perfect. But if you keep your heart pure and right towards the Lord, God will get you to your destiny. You can make a lot of mistakes. David made a lot of mistakes. Solomon made mistakes. Peter made mistakes. Thomas was doubting and made mistakes. Go down the line. Elijah doubted God, one of the greatest prophets, and then said he's the only one. He just wants to quit and die, and he just can't believe how God didn't come out. There's nobody else but him. And having a pity party, one of the most powerful men of God who ever lived. And he even gave in to circumstances at times. But Elijah's heart was right. He loved the Lord. And God took a double portion of his mantle and put it on Elisha's life and carried out that mission. But what I want you to see is if your heart's pure towards him, that's what God cares about. So today, don't try to fix all your actions and be better and do better. Just get closer to him. Just remove the barriers between you and him, the relational barriers. You might just be so busy that you haven't had time to spend with Jesus. And that doesn't sound very deep, but if you have that intimacy and that relationship with him, Everything else in your life will fall into line and God will open doors that no man can shut. And this is a continual relationship. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd seal what you said today, Father, by faith. 
And Lord, today we dedicate to you, Father, this season of our lives. We are not nearsighted, but we are seeing the big picture, Lord. And I thank you that we would make decisions that line up with you, that we'd not take the easy route, Lord, or give up or quit or complain or magnify issues, Lord. But today, we offer those thousand sacrifices. We magnify you, God. We say you're so valuable to us, Lord. You are so precious to us, God. And we don't ask for earthly success, Lord. We say, Lord, we want to honor you in our life, Lord. Whatever it takes, give us the wisdom, Lord, to navigate our life and to fulfill fulfill the reason that we're still here, God. We want to please you and not man and not ourselves, God. We love you so much, and I thank you for a new season and breakthroughs in all of our lives in this season. In Jesus' name.